when you're mindful of the body. That's when we are focusing on the breath. The Buddha compares it to a post for tying down the mind. In one case, he compares it to a post to which they tie an elephant. They've gotten the elephant out of the out of the forest, out of the jungle, bringing him in. They're going to train him, and the first thing they've got to do is get rid of his forest habits. So they tie them to the post. Now, if they just tied him to the post, he'd spend his whole time rebelling. So they have to give him food. The food here, of course, when you're meditating, is a sense of well-being that you can create, first with the breath, then with the fact that the mind can stay settled there. This is one of the things that really strengthens the mind, is that it gets an object that it can stay with continually. And in not jumping around, it doesn't use up a lot of energy. And that gradually develops into strength. Now to stay settled, and to be happy to stay settled, that's where we bring in the breath. Try to get a sense of breath energy in the body where it's lacking, where it's out of balance, and try to bring things into balance, and then protect it as much as you can. And you find lots of different things are going to harm it. Energy is coming from outside. Energy is coming from inside. And if you let these other energies invade, the sense of nourishment, the sense of well-being that comes from the breath disappears, and then the mind is hungry. And what often happens when the mind is hungry, it'll just grab anything it can. It's like the coyotes around here. If you've ever looked at their scat, you'll find plastic rope, you'll find all kinds of stuff. In other words, when they can't find anything good to put in their mouths, they just take whatever. Of course, it can't be good to have plastic rope going through your system. But the damage that does is much less than the things we take into our system when the mind is hungry. We go out looking for sights, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile sensations. We are fascinated by our sensual fantasies. When the Buddha talks about the problem of sensuality, it's not the objects out there that are the, that are the problem. It's our fascination with going over a particular sensual desire, making plans, making, making adjustments. There are not that many things that people get fascinated with sensu in terms of sensuality, but they can go over them again and again and again. If you take a picture of the mind when it's feeding like this, what kind of feeding would it be? So it's important that you maintain this, this post here and also feed the mind well. The Buddha makes another analogy of the post. He says it's like having six different animals on leashes. And if you tie the ends of the leashes together, then if there's no post to which they're tied, then they'll just drag one another around. And who knows how far they'll go. But when you've got the post, okay, you tie the ends of the leashes to the post, then they'll pull and pull and pull, but eventually they'll have to give up, because they can go only so far. So as you go through the day, you want to make sure that you exert restraint over the senses, and that's what tying the animals to a post means. But it also means, it means that you use this mindfulness of the body as the post. When you stay here with the body, you can see the energy is moving in, the energy is moving out, and you don't have to move with them. And John Lee makes this point. He says, discernment is what stays still as other things in the mind move. And you want to see these movements. 
when you go out for something, why are you going? What impels the mind? If it's lust pulling you out, okay, the Buddha first has you contemplate the object, but not in the way you ordinarily contemplate it. You try to contemplate it to see that something is really not worth all the effort that goes into it. That's so you can eventually drop the object of the lust, so you can look at the lust in and of itself. What is it like to have this movement in the mind? Where is it coming from? What kind of hunger are you trying to satisfy? And does it really satisfy the hunger? Or is it like those potato chips where they say, we can't, I bet you can't eat just one. The first one makes you hungry for the second one, for the third one, the fourth one. And then you've eaten the bag of potato chips, and what have you got? Cholesterol in your system, high blood pressure, all the bad things that come with gorging yourself on potato chips. And is your hunger really satisfied? No. So this post you got here, you want to make sure that the animals are well fed. In other words, you feed the mind in particular. That's the big one. If the mind is well fed with concentration, well fed with breath energy, and if you learn how to protect it, then you've got something good to feed on. And then when you see the other animals wanting to feed here or feed there, you ask yourself, where are you going? What are you going to gain from this? And as long as the mind is in well fed, it will be willing to do this kind of analysis. It's when it's really hungry that it says, I don't care, I'm hungry. It goes running out. This is why concentration is such an important part of the path. It's what gives you your energy to really do it and to be on board. And you're doing it in a healthy way. There are times when you can force yourself to stick with the path. just out of sheer determination. But that can go only so far. Try to find a way to breathe that makes you feel really full. You get a sense of the breath energy. Where does it feel depleted? Where does it feel lacking? Can you tell? Are you sensitive to this? Try to sensitize yourself to this area of your awareness. Because it's where there's a lot of hunger. And the more you can create the sense of stillness, that, that discernment that stays still as everything else moves. And the quicker you are to detect the movements, then you begin to see. You get closer and closer to what's stirring the mind out, even when you've got this sense of well-being here. How does the mind get bored with it? What is it that wants change all the time? What lack is there still there, even when the body feels nourished and when most of the mind will feel nourished by the breath? There'll still be some part that's hungering for its old feeding habits. It's only in this way that you get to see where the problem lies. As the Johns are constantly saying, you start out the practice thinking that this is causing you anger, or this thing outside is causing you lust, or this thing is causing you jealousy, and you realize those things aren't causing anything. The mind is looking for something to be angry about, or lustful about, or jealous about. Why is it looking for these things? You have to turn around and look inside. You see that the troublemaker is in here. You're living with the troublemaker. Many times you participate with the troublemaker. And you have to ask yourself, at what point can you decide that you've had enough? And when you side with the Dharma, that offers you a way out. When you see that Dharma as your friend, and you see it as a source of genuine nourishment, that's half the battle right there.